277. Yes, once you get there, if you please stand. And uh, let me pray. Uh, Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for all that you're doing in our hearts and lives. We, we think of those, Lord, that are not able to be with us today, those that are sick, those that are going uh, through very trying times in their life. We ask now that you would be with them and comfort them. And, Lord, help our prayers to encourage them. We ask you to give them strength and guide them through this time, that you'd be ever close in a special way. We ask now for your blessings on our service and the preaching and teaching of your word and the singing of hymns as we seek to worship you. We ask now for your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. God leads us along. 277.
Try to remember that. <laughs> On the third. Let the storm be breezes blow their cry cannot alarm me. I am safe, we shall to be protected by God's hand. Here the sun is always shining, here the north can harm me. I am safe forever. that's always, I say that a lot and I guess it's really bad when, when a preacher says that. So let me change that again, as I always do. Let me be transparent. Um, I feel guilty that we don't sing more of those songs like that more often. 
But there's so many really good songs, and, and when I'm sitting there choosing them out, there is a tendency to go to those songs you know better. But we miss so much when we do that. Even in the Red Book, we've sang that for I don't know how long. But there's still a ton of good songs in there that we don't really know, you know. Um, but I do pray that you are encouraged when we sing a new song. I do pray also that uh, you get the message that those songs give. Some songs give basically the same message, but we have sang some new ones that, that um, it doesn't deviate from the Word of God, but it gives us another message from the Word of God that, that holds true. And so we, we have a lot to be rejoicing for. Uh, one day all this will pass away. And we don't have to worry about that next world. God's not going to let anybody uh, distort it. Okay. So anyway, if you have your, your Bible, turn to Judges chapter 9. Judges chapter 9. I guess the challenge uh, this morning is to be attentive to the lesson and to, um, to pray for the, everything to work good in the kitchen. You know, <laughs> so we're already finding there's some discrepancies on getting some things to work for us, as always. Um, but anyway, um, anyway, we're, we had just finished 36, and we're now uh, on 36, uh, 37, excuse me. We finished 36, and we're starting 36. That's really a feat. Um, all right, on 37, uh, as we begin, it says, God spake again and said, see there, there come uh, people down by the uh, middle of the land, and another company come along the plain of Meoinim, or something like that. Anyway, I don't know exactly uh, how to uh, say that. I, I think of, when I look at that, I think of Moinim, but I don't know if that's the way it's pronounced. Um, I give Gaul, Gaul a lot of credit here. Uh, we look at uh, Gaul in this, and, and, and he's not really swayed from... Uh, by Zabul's or Zabul's speaking and what he sees. He's trusting his own judgment. Um, so he's not being swayed from what he sees. But I wonder at this point if he is alarmed. Um, we mentioned at the end last week that, you know, he'd seen one uh, group coming and, and Zabal was, was telling them, I thou seest a shadow of the mountain in the mountains. It's nothing that I know. But now he's, he sees, oh, two shadows? You know, this is a little different. Uh, he's seeing two groups of people uh, come down, one by the middle way and another by the plain. Um, and so is he alarmed? Is this thing beginning to concern, concern him? Um, I really, when I, when I look at this and read this, I don't see the Bible in its word and giving us any alarm. Uh, I see that he is attentive. I see that he is concerned about events, and, and I think it's rightfully so. His mind, uh, I would think as his position, his mind would be on these things and, and wondering what they mean. Um, he's not allowed, allowing this as a bull to pull him off the subject. And I think, again, that is wisdom because he reveals in 28, he knew that Zabul was an officer of Abimelech. Um, personally, my own opinion is I think about anything that uh, Zabul said would be subject to doubt. I don't think I would trust uh, anything he said at all. I would take everything with, well, I think they say with a grain of salt. Kind of like, yeah, you know, I don't know if I want to trust anything he says. Uh, so he's, he's really, uh, it's not, he doesn't have the words, no. He doesn't have the credibility to be accepted that whatever he says is true. Um, when I think this thing through, I put myself in God's place and in the position he's in and what he's done. And I try to live that out and determine in my mind how he would think. And, and what I see is he's in a strange town with men he knows that some are loyal to Abimelech. He knows uh, Zabul is an officer. He also knows there would be some people in there that are not loyal to Abimelech. Um, he understands, I think, the situation fairly well about what's going on there. I, you know... I would think he would also accept there's a possibility uh, that Abimelech would be told of what he said or, or maybe the threat. Maybe that did not enter into his mind. But um, if Abimelech was told and he assumed that, would he not also assume that that threat would be removed or Abimelech would make 
motion uh, or an effort to, to stop uh, any threat on him. Is it ready? Um, I, would, I would think that, that yeah, um, you know, for me personally, I kind of feel like a caged animal. I would be so nervous. I would be so wary. I mean, I, I couldn't get peace. I would, I'm just, so I kind of put that on him, but I don't really see that coming through. Um, but at this point, Gaul, when he says he spake again and said, see there uh, come people down by the middle and another company. I think the moment that was, was, was said, I would think at that time he would be determining several things. One, um, these are not just shadows. That's one of the first things. The second thing I would say is, you know, um, this is, these people are split, so this is a possible threat. Something isn't normal here. Something's going on. And so that would have me um, uh, a little edgy. And then the third thing I think would enter my mind is, why is this officer of Abimelech seemingly trying to put me at rest or provoke me or whatever he's doing? Why is he so engaging at this point? All this would, would it maybe mean nothing, but to me, you know, it would just throw the wires off. And in these last statements, it's like Zabul is trying to give him, get him to lower his guard. They're just shadows. What you worried about? Are you nervous or something? What, what is it? Um, for me, all the alarms, the red flags, the flares, everything are activated. Where's Gaul? I don't know yet. Um, uh, something is happening, and I think he realizes that. I, I, I do want to uh, draw your attention to something besides that beeper. Um, while we do not know what Gaul is thinking, there is a pretty good lesson here for all of us. Uh, what's the lesson? Think for yourself. Think for yourself. Uh, don't allow somebody to think for you. In our world today, there are, are a lot of those that will tell you, oh, there's no such thing as heaven. Hell, it's not really literal. It's, it's just, you know, it's just to scare you. The Bible is a book of stories. Um, they'll tell you all this stuff. Uh, you know, what good is the, the Word of God now? It was written years ago. It, it's not for us today. It's not applicable. Uh, if you believe what they're telling you, if you believe all these things, you need to understand in the end you're still accountable for what you believe. You know, there's a, used to be a bumper sticker that said, um, God said it, that settles it. I believe it, that settles it, you know. No, God said it, it's done. Whether you believe it or not, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's over. Uh, you can choose to believe the facts, or you can choose to deny them, but that doesn't change it. Just because you don't want to believe the truth, it doesn't change what it is. And one day you'll be accountable to God for that. Uh, these people that want to change your opinion, want to guide you and tell you all these things, I, I love, uh, no, I, I guess that's the wrong way to say it. I am amused by, uh, I read the, the paper sometime that comes, um, and it has these spiritual advisors in the back. These spiritual advisors will read to you your horoscope. They will connect you with the spirit world. They will do all these things for you. Except for get you through the door of heaven. They'll get you right through the gates of hell though. They'll bind you in chains so hard fast that you'll never break through unless you just turn to Jesus. You just can't do it. And, and, and I'm amused at what they say. Um, not that I think it's laughable but of the foolishness of what we're speaking of here. Uh, these people have no idea what they're talking about. You know, outside the Word of God, none of us do. And these people are going to connect you with the spirit realm. Yeah, they will. They're going to connect you all right, but you're not going to like the temperature there. It's going to be turned up a little high for your taste, and it's going to be forever at that point. Don't let these people guide you and make your decisions for you. But yet there are some people that are so wrapped up in these things, whatever they say, they take it as foundational fact. Be careful. Be careful. There is only one person's opinion that you can trust. And by the way, it's not mine. It's God's. And his is really not an opinion. It's a fact. It's the truth. Uh, think for yourself. Take the word of God. Take what they say and balance it with the word of God. Pray through it. Decide for yourself. 
Um, people come to me sometimes and, you, and they, they, they will say this. What do you think the will of God is for my life? Boy, that's pretty good. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you God's general will for your life, all right? God's general will for your life is that you read the Bible, that you pray, that you spend time with Him. That's what He wants all of us to do. He wants you to witness. He wants you to memorize. He wants you to meditate on His Word. Now, if you're talking about His specific will, you're not going to learn that until you get the general will right. <laughs> until you develop a relationship with God, you're never going to know specifically what He's designed for your life. But it's always, it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, people do, we have a tendency to, a, to, to be led. A desire for somebody, make it easy on me, you know. Tell me what I need to do. And then you say, well, be in church every Sunday. I can't do that. <laughs> then why did you ask? You know, why, why did you engage me in this? Anyway, um, just understand that nobody is going to have to stand for your decisions but you in the end. Uh, the, the, the price uh, that you have to pay is not going to be divided between you and them because they give you advice. That doesn't work that way. Um, uh, if you refuse to accept Jesus Christ as personal Savior, they're not going to suffer your fate in hell. They already have their own. If you refuse um, uh, to, as a, a believer to, to do the will of God, they're not going to lose rewards. You're going to lose rewards. And so you need to understand um, the, to accept their counsel, anybody's counsel over God's is detrimental. Uh, you, you, don't, you, you go to God and look. Um, I, I like to tell people, um, people say, uh, call me pastor. I, I really still cringe at that, you know, because I'm a missionary, so I, I do struggle with that a little bit. I accept the, the position um, at this point, but you understand what I'm saying. You know, it's, it's, a, it's tough. Um, but I, I like to think of my, myself as more of a guide. Maybe that's wrong. I'm trying to guide you on a path where you'll grow spiritually. And through that time with God, on that path, the Spirit of God sooner or later has to be your guide. You, ha you have to leave from me to him. As you mature, that should be a natural process. I can help you along the way, but I can't get you there, okay? I can, I can point, I'm like the sign on the side of the road, this way to Albuquerque or what, you know what I'm saying? That's about all I can do. I can point you. He can take you if you just in him. So anyway, um, I think all here are smart enough to know he can't take Zabul's word. Um, I, I think he understands that the moment he does, he's placing his uh, life in Zabul's hands. Uh, and, and you have to ask yourself, we just talked about these people trusting these spiritualists or whatever they are, these spiritual guides. Um, whom, whom are you willing to place your life in their hands? Who is it that you trust more than yourself and more than God that you're willing to place your life, your eternal security in their hands? And that's what we're getting. That's the question, is it not? Who are you going to trust for the outcome of all eternity? For either hell or rewards? Gaul had a lot of faults, I believe. He had a big mouth. Uh, he, he said things he probably shouldn't have said. The, spool, the fool spills all his, his mind. He tells what's in his heart. I think Gaul was foolish in that manner. But in this instance, in not listening, he was not foolish. He was smart. He thought for himself. And we need to do that as well. Take time to think for ourselves. Then we go on to 38. It said, Then said Zebul unto him, Where now is thy mouth? Wherewith thou sayest, Who is Abimelech, that we should serve him? Is not this the people that thou hast despised? Go out, I pray now, and fight with them. Um, at this point, I think... Uh, the, the, the blinders or the tunnel vision or whatever you want to call it, uh, his, his hidden agenda is starting to come out a little bit. It, it may not be fully out, um, but I think if he was trying to deceive Gaul, there's a good, time, a good chance now that Gaul recognizes uh, what's going on and, and, and Zabul would recognize this is not going to work. Because, oh, those are shadows. Well, those, no, those are people. You know, oh, yeah, you go out and fight them now. I, 
the time for talk is over. Abimelech's here. So what you going to do? Um, the first thing I, I, I think of is you need to be careful what you say. You need to be careful of your words. Because now we see those words he was speaking. Um, first of all, the words uh, that Gaul spoke got him into this mess. Second of all, the words the bull was speaking was a distraction from what was going to happen. Uh, from the truth of the circumstance at this point. Has that ever happened? Has anybody spoke something to you to draw you away from the truth of what was going on? That's not uncommon. Not at all. Sometimes we don't realize it and sometimes we do. Um, people, there's a lot of people that, that tell us things to distract us from the truth. I'll tell you a good one that's really kind of, it happens a lot, but you don't really think of it. If you, if you ever see a car commercial, and I, I'm sure they still do this. We don't have TV to watch, uh, so to speak. Um, uh, we're not connected that way. We're not connected. Um, but they say, uh, oh, here's this car. It's 35000 but don't worry. You deserve it. Don't worry about it, what it costs. It's only eighty-eight, eighty-eight a month, but you deserve it. They tell you you deserve it. They distract you from the truth of what it's going to cost. Or if you can even pay for it, oh, you deserve it. They're distracting you. Then you, what do you do? I deserve it. Well, <laughs> go ahead. And you'll deserve the payments if you sign that paper too. And it's not as easy to pay for sometimes. Um, so we're seeing that distraction. Uh, I was, you know, in, in saying that, uh, some thoughts come through my mind just then. As a preacher, this happens a lot to me. Um, people saying things to distract me. Um, for some reason, and this is amusing to me very much, and I'm sorry, uh, maybe it should not be. For some reason, some people feel like they can live like the devil, cuss up the whirlwind, and then they come around me and walk daintily and think I'm fooled. They talk about how good they are. They, they say all these things, and I'm thinking... Wouldn't I stand behind you in the line when you just bless them people from the devil? You know, or, or wasn't this or that going on? Um, it happens a lot. Uh, for some reason, um, you'll get around people and um, they'll let the curse words slip. That's what they like to say, that it slipped. I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Um, and uh, they slip so much in front of me, they get bashful and apologize. And I'm thinking, that's an awful lot of slipping to do for somebody who doesn't cuss. I mean, my goodness. You just don't slip that much unless you're walking on ice. Uh, and apparently that's what they're doing around me. They're, they're trying to be careful. Um, have you ever had those people that maybe have done something uh, or maybe uh, they, have, they feel like that you might have something against them that they have said or done, and yet when you get around, they talk so much you can't interject anything. You ever had that? Talk incessantly until they leave. And I'm thinking, I was going to deal with them with this, but they never let me have a word of it in edgewise. You know, they just kept talking. Um, guilt or whatever it is. Uh, I always leave wondering, what were they thinking in their mind? Um, anyway, uh, a lot of the times they do that to keep you from dealing with their spiritual condition or keep uh, and themselves out of an awkward situation. Um, you want to hear the honest truth is? Sometimes I find it very hard to keep my mouth shut too. Maybe for different reasons. Um, he said, where now, where is now thy mouth wherein thou saidest, who is Abimelech? that we should serve him. Is not this the people that thou hast despised? Go out, I pray now, and fight with them. What happened? Gaul got to talking. He got into a situation where he was comfortable. And he got to talking with these people and boasting. And he said some things he shouldn't have said. You ever been there? You ever got in a situation where you were just talking and then all of a sudden you said something and you froze. You realized they didn't know that maybe. 
You know, maybe you spilt the beans on their surprise birthday party, or maybe it was something more serious, you know, that you shouldn't have said. And you're like, you just, it just, you walk away from there wishing you'd never said them. I kind of wonder where Gaul's at right now. Is he wishing he had never said some of these things? Truth is, you, you really never know who's listening. You don't know when you say something if the person that, that's around hearing is for you or against you. You don't know where, how far that's going to travel. Um, I got a lot of little things I can say that, but that's just taking me down the road, so I'm not going there yet. Um, this is a bull. Uh, I'm sure. I'm, I'm still not sure what his character is exactly, or what kind of person he is. I tr I'm trying to place myself in his skin and trying to think like he thinks. And, and uh, I think, first of all, I think he's pretty sharp. Okay, I don't think he's an idiot. I think he understands that if Nabal gets in, he's his, it's a threat to him. I think if Abimelech comes in, you know, he understands that I've got some favor there. So I think he's smart in that. Um, I think he's using these situations here to try to get gain. He understands what he needs to do. Um, but I'm still not sure of everything about of his character. So we go on to 39. It says, And Gaul went out before the men of Shechem and fought with Abimelech. This is a very, very, very interesting um, uh, statement when you compare it with 40, and I'll get to that. Now, I'm not sure how much choice Gaul had to start off with to fight or not to fight. He had already said what he said. The message had already took to Abimelech. Abimelech was now before him. He was at the city gates. What's he going to do? What do you do when you run your mouth to a lot of your men friends and you're making yourself look good and now all of a sudden it stands up you've got to deal with this? What do you do? I, you know, you're kind of pushed um, uh, whether you fight or not at this point. Um, now, he goes out to fight. So he did reveal some willingness to fight Abimelech, but he also, in doing so, he revealed an unpreparedness for the battle. Um, now, I'm going to get to that a little bit more, but let me just say this. Let me talk about this preparedness for a minute. Before entering a fight, there's something you always do. Before you build a building, there's something you always do. So what is that? Before you lay the foundation, it's, it's actually, it's in the Bible. You count the cost. You think about what, what's this foundation and, and the, the building going to cost? What is going out to war? These, these comparisons are in the Bible. So how much has Gaul really thought and prepared for what's going? How much has he counted the cost? Prepared himself for what's coming. He had a mouth. He was making merry. I don't see any preparation. I see a highwayman probably slipping in hiding and attacking. What pre preparation do you need to do? That's guerrilla warfare. You know, if you're doing it with guns, bang, 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 and out the, you know, gone. If you're doing it with, with arrows, gone. You don't have to stand and fight. This is totally different. Um, what do I mean by counting the cost? Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. You think of the consequences. Yes. And that's more, I'm, I'm generally leaning on that. She is absolutely correct. You think of what's involved. Consequences are part of what's involved. But that's the stress here at this point that I'm thinking of. Um, I remember um, uh, my sister uh, was raising kids, and I remember the advice she got once from pastor was, you don't want to fight every battle. Pick your battles. Some things are not being, are worth being fought over. Whether they eat their peas or, or, or not, that may not be as important as in how they dress. So if you could choose a battle, be sure you choose them wisely. And, and when you look at what's going here, you know, uh, some, when I say count the cost, even in winning sometimes, well, I'll, I'll take the sometimes out. Even in winning, it costs you something. You know, remember what I said about Vera and I grow old gracefully. Some things aren't worth arguing over. They're more damaging to the relationship than just to say, you know, okay, <laughs> you might know she's dead wrong. She don't believe it. 
I believe it. She might think it's the other way. I'm dead wrong, and she knows it, but I don't believe it. Who cares? It's not worth the battle. The cost of it is too great. When you enter into a battle, and, and I use this illustration, well, I use this saying when it talks about um, of the tribe of Zebulun, of uh, Second Chronicles, I think it's 1233. Such as went out to war. What type of people go to war? Those types of people that are prepared, those types of people that are counted the cross, those types of people that are loyal to the cause. You have to understand when you go into battle, it may be lethal to you. This could take his life. Is the fight worth that? Is it worth you losing your testimony? Is it worth you costing somebody from coming to the Lord and, and, and even getting saved or causing somebody to drop out of church, never to be... You understand what I'm saying? There's a, there's a lot of ramifications to every battle. Um, uh, it's too easy to argue over things that are not worth the cost. It really is. Um, and then, what, what will you win? Is, what, is, is, is that which you win out of that battle worth the cost that it took you, you know? Have you ever really won? When I was a child, I used to really want, uh, when we would go to these restaurants, there was these little, back then there was a quarter, I think they're a dollar and two dollars now, these little capsules with something in it. I won't, I won't, I won't. Then you get it and you open it up and it's like, this is so cheap. And I was a kid and I realized that. It wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth it. And I was a kid and knew that. And you're going to find that out. That's pretty true. When we get to argue with people, we, and, and next time you, you go to talk with them, they don't want to talk with you. really wasn't worth losing that friendship. Uh, we, we, sometimes we want to do things. And we set aside the word of God. We set aside the people of God. And then we realize we're in the midst of, you know what? It really wasn't worth it. I miss that more than I'm enjoying this. And so you have to take all that in consideration. Um, I, I learned to give up some arguments with Vera. In, in, in my thinking, I had to ask myself, am I so vain that if I lose this thing, it's going to be a dent in my pride? Is it, is it that big a deal for me? And I said, you know, I love my wife more than that. Dent it, honey, dent it. I don't care, you know. <laughs> Um, I need to lose a lot more arguments. If she'll love me more for losing arguments, I'll lose every one of them and be happy. Well, for the most part. <laughs> you still struggle with losing, you know. <laughs> but but you, you need to love and honor others' opinion as well. You know, we don't have that in our day, do we? What I say matters. What you say doesn't matter to a hill of beans. That's, that's really the mindset today. Well... I disagree. But however, if they want to say that, I'll let them win that argument and I'll walk off knowing they're wrong. You know? Just some things is just not worth arguing. Now let me put it on the other side. Sometimes you don't back down. Sometimes it doesn't matter the cost. I think I told you we'd sit with those men in coffee at A&W and, and they sometimes would, would get so vulgar, I'd just say, hey, boys, i got to go. Well, and typically, I'd let them go about their old sayings, and, and they would deride me, and, and they would treat me like a dog, and that was fine. But the line was when they talked about God. Mm-hmm. Then I stood up, and when I say stood up, I never, didn't necessarily stand up, but I stood up for what was right, and I give them an earful. And, of course, then it was time to go. You know, but you understand what I'm saying. Sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes you just stand for what's right. When it comes to God and God's word, stand. The Bible says, quit ye, be ye like men. Stand. It doesn't matter what anybody else does, what their opinions are, or anything else. You stand on the word of God, but be sure when you're standing, you're standing correctly on his word. Don't worry about the rest. Allow God to take over. He'll take it. Um... It says here that he went out before the men of Shechem and fought with Abimelech. Let's, let's, um, I want to go to this next verse real quick. Um, it says, and Abimelech chased him and he fled before him. 
and many were overthrown and wounded, even into the entering of the gate. Now, I went back once I read this, and I looked up uh, more closely this idea. He says in 39, and God went forth before the, went out before the men of Shem and fought. The idea here in this fought, he never engaged. He never engaged, but he fled. The idea is he, he actually never fought the man, but he, he fled before him. Uh, why? Why would he go out to fight and then flee? He hadn't call, counted the cost. Some people fought, fight. Uh, odds do not go in. There was a, and I don't know the story, I wouldn't plan on saying this, there was a man... Um, special forces <clears throat> and he was killed he was he's actually been awarded since then but he went into a no-win situation with the enemy so they could evacuate his buddies out he knew he was going to die there was no way he could win but he went in to die so that they could live he already counted the cost he knew what it was going to cost him going in if this man had counted the cost he would not have fled you need to count the cost. And I'm going to get into this a little bit later, a little differently. And, and I'm going to, to give you the, go through the idea of being unprepared for the battle that we're in, uh, understanding that we are claiming to be believers. Um, and the moment you claim that you're a child of God, you're claiming you're in the battle. We're in a war. We're in a war for the souls of men, the glory of God. We're in a war. Uh, and you, we'd better be preparing for what lies ahead. Uh, you think it's bad now? Read the end of the book. It gets a lot worse. We need to be prepared for whatever God's got for us in store. I don't know what the future holds. I don't know. I don't know when it's going to happen. But I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. Okay? And, and this is our time to prepare, to be preparing for the war. All right, we're done. Um, I'm out of time. Matter of fact, I think I slipped into your dime this time. So anyway. Um.